I was in Marinello in Modena, Italy in October, and I was asked to go spend some time at this venerable brand, okay? Ferrari just celebrated its 75th anniversary. Ferrari is a company that is always thinking about the future. How many of you consider yourself to be environmentalists? How many people participate in environmental causes? Right? Because what's, what's coming down the road? What do you think Ferrari is afraid of more than anything? What's the biggest fear that Ferrari has? What's that? Elon Musk. No, 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 no. Well, it, it, you're, you're certainly directionally correct. Electric Ferrari cars. will never do an electric car. Electric cars. Yeah. They will never do one. They'll never do one because if, you, if you've never driven a Ferrari, it's like taming a wild Mustang. Okay? It's an extraordinarily powerful vehicle. And they will never do it. But, but to that point, what do you think is the worst thing that can happen to Ferrari? And many countries have already announced that this is going to happen. Sometime in 2025, 2030, 2035, they're going to outlaw internal combustion engines. Okay? They're going to outlaw the power plant that sits in the cars that we've been driving since 1900. What does Ferrari do the day that you can no longer put an internal combustion power plant, an engine, into that beast? That's what they're starting to think about. So they realize that the future that is coming at them is going to be hostile, right? There's a scenario that says that the environmentalists will actually accelerate the illegality of internal combustion engines, and they've got to figure out what they're going to do when they grow up. So one of the recent experiences was to go off and run a scenario planning exercise with Ferrari to help them think about alternate futures and alternate strategies that will allow them to remain relevant and to remain the brand that they are, right? It's the most recognizable brand in the world. And they're already anticipating worse scenarios so that they can be prepared when it inevitably comes, okay? So the great Austrian economist, Joseph Schumpeter, said something that was very simple but very true. Economic progress in a capitalistic society means turmoil, okay? Certainly look at Blockbuster, look at Gillette. Yeah, they're going through turmoil, absolutely, okay? Here's what's a fascinating thing. The Standard & Poor's 500 is similar to the Fortune 500, the 500 largest companies in the United States. We could equally talk about the Global 2000 or a lot of other benchmarks. Back in 1960, when John F. Kennedy was president, the average tenure, the average length of time that a company would exist would be close to 70 years. Today, the average amount of time that a company exists is 15 years, and it's falling like a stone because of all of this digital disruption, because companies cannot keep up with it, because of the friggin' bottleneck that's running the company, okay? So this is not the first time that society has faced a crossroads of disruptive innovation. We've been seeing this forever, right? We went from people that were farmers and hunters and gatherers, and we went to the point where we had the first industrial revolution, right? What was the first industrial revolution? What were some of the technologies that allowed people to move away from the farm into cities and factories that led to the urbanization of places like New York and Chicago and cities like that? Any idea what that was called? The first industrial revolution? What technologies were, were brought to the world that allowed people to stop farming and growing their own food and they could actually go get a paid job in a city? No? The first industrial revolution was the invention of mechanical and steam power. Okay? So, this is a very important point. All right? And the point is very simple. The winds are blowing outside, right? Last weekend, I don't know what it was like here, but in Boston, we had 100-mile-an-hour winds, okay? In the economy, 100-mile-an-hour winds are blowing every day. And when the winds are blowing, executive teams have a choice. They can go hide in the basement, and they can get on their knees and pray, and they can hope that the wind passes them by. Never works. Just ask Wayne Huizenga how well that worked. Not so good. Or they can go build a windmill. They can say, you know what? There's a lot of wind howling out there. Why don't we harness the wind? Why don't we exploit the wind and turn it into something that we can be 
advantage by, before others do, which is exactly what Ferrari is running here. Okay? So, of course, the second industrial revolution was the electrical or the electricity revolution. This was something that had been driven by a man named Thomas Alva Edison, the wizard of Menlo Park, New Jersey, who had over a thousand patents. He was not even an educated man. He didn't even finish high school. And yet he had a thousand patents to his name. Okay? He was a polymath. He was a Renaissance man. There was nothing this guy couldn't figure out or didn't know about. Okay? And he built an innovation factory about 30 miles from here in Menlo Park, New Jersey. And it's not just that he created the light bulb. That's a very superficial understanding of what he did. Think about when cars were invented. The entire country was required roadways and bridges and tunnels, right? It wasn't just the car. It was all of the infrastructure that allowed cars to go from one end of the country to the other. People take it for granted when you flip a light switch in a room. Where does that electricity come from? Edison created the entire infrastructure. He understood how to drive power from coal plants. He understood how to take the power and turn it into electricity, how to send that electricity thousands of miles over wires, how to distribute it at a city breakpoint, how to bring it to the street level, how to bring it to the home level. He completely reconfigured the entire world to be able to run on electricity. This was the second industrial revolution. And just like the first, what you saw was at least 30 years after it was clear that electricity was strongly favorable to mechanical and steam power, 30 years later, people were still like the frigging bottleneck saying, I don't know if we're ready for electricity yet. So most of the major companies that were the dominant trusts and the dominant corporations in the era of mechanical and steam went bankrupt. And you see this continuously. Another famous example was the railroads, right? It used to be that the railroads were one of the dominant industries in America. Why weren't any of the railroads companies that were now leaders in the auto industry? None of them were. None of them had the imagination to say, we're in the transportation business. And if people are going to move away from taking trains to driving, why don't we pursue becoming auto manufacturers? But they didn't. Most of them went bankrupt. And then General Motors and Ford and Chrysler and Dodge and all those names from that era came forward, right? So we see this continuous loss of ability to bridge from one S curve to the other, okay? So third industrial revolution, obviously computerization, but we're already deeply into the fourth industrial revolution now, which is the combination of cyber and physical systems, right? So what are some examples of fourth industrial revolution technologies? What are some of the technologies that we read about every day that are sort of the exemplars, the pillars of the fourth industrial revolution? Cryptocurrency. Say again? Cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency, yeah, absolutely. Social media. Now, social media was really the third industrial revolution, more IT. See, the, the thing about the fourth industrial revolution, it's a combination of a physical system with IT. Okay. E-commerce. Say again? E-commerce. E-commerce was actually third industrial revolution. So I'll help you guys out, okay? Blockchain. Blockchain, cryptocurrency, robotics, drones, yeah. autonomous vehicles, okay? All of these, you know, the internet of things. So when you have, who has a Nest thermostat in your home? Right? Anybody know Nest? Okay. So Nest is a company that is... Again, because it's a combination of a physical system, it controls the heat or cooling in your home, but it's connected to a smartphone, it's connected to an app, okay? So drones, for sure, robotics, for sure, autonomous vehicles, as you said, okay? These are the next generation of technologies that are changing the world, okay? So the message that I try to deliver to my clients is that if you want things to stay the same, then things will have to change. Now that may sound convoluted, that may sound stupid. What am I saying here, right? If you want your company to continue to be relevant, if you want your company to continue to be profitable, if you want your company to remain in business, then things are gonna have to change, okay? It's not a matter of maybe, maybe not, no. It's a matter of Yes and always.